So, this is going to be a video about what makes nuclear weapons so scary, because I've been doing a bit more research into nuclear weapons recently, because obviously I talk a lot about chemical weapons and sort of biological weapons on here, but not so much about nuclear weapons, strange enough, even though they're the most famous of all of them. So, what makes them so scary? There's a quite a few factors to go into in this video, which I will do. So, let's just start off with the pure size of the bombs, or the explosive force of the bombs, if you like, because the nuclear weapons themselves don't have to be so big. Now, what we're going to be using is measurements of TNT for this video in the metric system, because that's what, you know, is the easiest way of thinking about these and understanding the sheer scale of the power of a nuclear weapon. So, you have dynamite, or TNT, let's just use the word TNT because that's the proper word, which I don't think is pure dynamite, but lots of people use it interchangeably. So, you have TNT. And TNT as an explosive is fairly big in itself. Now, a kilogram of TNT, and I'm sure you can all know what a kilogram weighs, that makes a pretty hefty explosion. You can go on YouTube, look at videos of a kilo of TNT being detonated, and you'd realise if you were pretty close to that, you'd be dead. You know, there's a lot of explosive force in a kilo of TNT. Now, lots of conventional bombs were, you know, like anywhere between several kilos of TNT to about um, a metric ton of TNT. A metric ton is a thousand kilos, so easy to think of. You could have, you know, one kilo, ten kilos, a hundred kilos, two hundred kilos, all the way up to a thousand kilos, but to simplify it, a thousand kilos is called a ton or a metric ton, because there's an imperial ton, but that's a different measurement. So the metric ton is a thousand kilograms of TNT. Now, one thousand kilos of TNT would be a pretty damn big explosion, you know, um, probably kill people for pretty... Um, close to it, you know, and further away, and it would shatter windows and everything much further away. So, obviously, a ton of TNT, a metric ton of TNT, would be pretty powerful. Now, what happens when you have a thousand tons? You get something called a kiloton. So, as I said, imagine that if you're close enough to it, a few kilos of TNT would it be easily enough to kill you. We've now gone to the thousands of... Um, you know, amounts of kilos of TNT to tons, and now we're going to kilotons, so once you've got a thousand, it's a thousand again. So a kiloton is pretty massive. So, if we look at the bombs used in World War II, um, Little Boy that was dropped on Hiroshima, and Fat Man which was dropped on Nagasaki, uh, Little Boy was, I think, estimated to be around 15 kilotons, and um, Fat Man dropped on Hiroshima was about 20 kilotons, Gadget, the test bomb used in the Trinity um, exercise, the first nuclear bomb ever detonated, I think was about 20 kilotons as well, but that wasn't a conventional bomb, it was like a big kind of sphere wired up, uh, wired up, you know, to a machine to do the test. So, if you've seen the pictures of Hiroshima or Nagasaki, you will know that obviously, if a 15 kiloton bomb air bursts, near a city, um, it's going to do an incredibly large amount of damage. Now, if you do look at the pictures of um, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, what you will see though is that the buildings that were made out of concrete did do a much better job at surviving, um, because lots of the buildings are wood, or, you know, like I guess light bricks. They're the ones that take the most damage. Now, the thing was, the bombs didn't stay at that size, they got bigger and bigger. So, during the Cold War, obviously America and the Soviets both developing their own nuclear weapons, and later um, Communist China, um, and obviously Great Britain as well, um, and the French. Um, you know, there was quite a few countries involved in the nuclear arms race. Well, but mostly it's between the Soviets and the Americans, because they obviously were the big world superpowers at the time. Now, what you have to now understand is that like we said, 15 or 20 kilotons is enough to kill 100 to 200,000 people in a city if detonate, you know, airburst. Um, and this is ignoring all the radiation, we'll get into this later. So, that's pretty big and scary. However, during the nuclear weapons tests, um, now I'm going to go into this again, I've mentioned this in other videos, there's two kinds of nuclear weapons primarily. There's what's called a fission device, um, which is an at atom bomb basically. Fission is where you split the atom, and then you have fusion, which is also known as thermonuclear, or the hydrogen bomb, where you essentially combine atoms together to make a much more devastating explosion. Now, the hydrogen bombs are the really scary ones, and we'll get into that in a moment. But, regardless, the nuclear bombs didn't stay at 15 and 20 kilotons. I think Greenhouse George, which is the biggest of the um, non-hydrogen bombs, I think that was about 250 kilotons. But... Basically, as you can understand, the bombs got bigger and bigger until it got into the hundreds of kiloton range, which, you know, 
is pretty big, and the bombs got smaller as well, this is the point. They managed to, you know, make smaller bombs with a much bigger explosive yield, um, due to, I guess, better engineering and design of the bombs. So, the point was that a bomber could carry more, you know, bombs with a higher explosive capacity, or with a nuclear missile you could put more on them, like a Merv warhead. So, that was that, but then you get to the hydrogen bombs. Now, the hydrogen bombs in themselves are incredibly frightening. They're in the megaton range of explosives. So, you know how a ton of, a metric ton of TNT is a thousand kilos, and a kiloton is a thousand, obviously, metri uh, metric tons. A megaton is a thousand kilotons. And they didn't just stop at one megaton. So, America tested two bombs which weren't, I don't think, proper bombs, they were kind of wired up to the systems, and they were called, well, they've obviously tested more than this, but the two famous ones was Ivy Mike, the first megaton bomb, um, you know, bomb to exceed over a megaton, first hydrogen bomb, and then there was Castle Bravo. Now, if you want to see how scary Castle Bravo was, um, there's a really good film called Trinity and Beyond, which is narrated by William Shatner, and it's about um, the development of nuclear weapons, and it's all like restored footage, some of it was previously classified, so... You know, it's got a really good soundtrack as well, I can't recommend it enough, but it's a very frightening film. Um, but when you get to the Castle Bravo sequence, and you realise just how much energy is being released by the nuclear weapon, um, you know, the hydrogen bomb, Castle Bravo was estimated, I think, to be about 6 megatons, how, you know, that's what they designed it for. However, it ended up being about 15 megatons when it was detonated, so it actually did kill and irradiate people that it wasn't designed to outside of the test area because of just the pure size of it. But wait, it gets better because the Soviets didn't want to be outdone, so the Soviets developed a bomb called the Tsar Bomb, as in the King Bomb, Tsar Bomber was its name, and the Tsar Bomb was 50 megatons. 50. And apparently the Soviets had the capacity to make it 100 megatons. Supposedly it was 40 miles high, the mushroom cloud from Tsar, when it was detonated, and the energy from it was recorded going around the world three times. So that gives you some idea of the explosive power of some of these weapons. So, let's just theoretically say 50 to 100 megatons was dropped on a city. Well, that entire city is gone. Um, the fireball range of it would get most of the city, anything else, the shockwaves, would, you know, completely destroy. Um, but what you have to understand in a nuclear war is it's not just one bomb dropped. It's not like everybody just targets the capital of the other country and that's it. No, there's hundreds, you know, thousands of nuclear warheads thrown around. Um, now, there's some good news, if you want to consider this good news, is that nuclear warheads are not the size of the Tsar bomb or Castle Bravo. They tend to be sort of four megatons or less, for the most part. Now, if you want the better news, um, it seems because there's not proper nuclear disarmament, but there is sort of... Um, some agreement, you know, on disarmament processes. It seems both Russia and America at the moment are quite keen on having more uh, lower yield bombs than they are on having um, lots of kind of monstrous uh, hydrogen bombs. So what that means is, in the event of a nuclear war, it's more likely that if only military targets were targeted, less collateral would happen due to, um, you know, if a hundred kilotons is dropped on every airbase, um, that's much better than four or five megatons being dropped on every airbase, if you kind of understand that. Um, it's not good regardless, but for civilians that's a good um, a good thing. But, you know, as we said, there's radiation and everything else in nuclear weapons. So, the most famous type of radiation from nuclear weapons is called fallout, but it's not really the only kind. So what you have is, the bomb is detonated. When a nuclear weapon is detonated, first you have an amazingly bright flash. Um, if you ever watch the test footage, you'll see all the people putting on like the goggles, which are like welding goggles, or like covering their eyes with their arms, or looking away. Um, I think it's about 8 to 10 seconds that flash lasts. If you look into the flash with your bare eyes, you can be permanently blinded, or you can have, you know, damaged vision for the rest of your life, because of just the pure energy of the light. You know, it'd be like staring at the sun if you were much closer to the sun than we are. So... That's what initially happens, you have the amazingly bright flash. Then you have several things happen. You have all of the gamma radiation and everything out come out of the bomb, and that basically starts to cook everything. Um, you get ultraviolet, gamma, and infrared, as far as I'm aware, that comes out, maybe x-rays as well, that come out of the bomb. So initially, you'll see things, if you watch some of the footage in Trinity and Beyond, you'll actually see the paint and everything essentially burning off of the um, things before anything ever hits them. 
um, which is incredibly frightening. I think there's one bit from the Castle Bravo segment in Trinity and Beyond where you can see all the pine, uh, not pine trees, sorry, the palm trees all um, basically cooking off, and then you can see the birds dying and falling out of the trees from just being essentially burnt alive by the, all the radiation, microwave essentially. So that's your initial thing. Then you have the shockwave hit. Um, and if you've ever seen these things, you'll see like vehicles crumple in on themselves and get thrown along like they've been hit by a giant with a sledgehammer or a golf club, you know, a golf club just taking a swing at them. Um, you'll see, you know, trees splinter. It looks like a massive, massive gust of wind hits things, basically. You see the trees all bend over and break. Um, you know, that, and this is when sort of houses start to collapse. Then what you get now is the sort of range of the nuclear fireball. Um, so this is going to obviously depend on the bomb with all of these things, how far the range is. But the nuclear fireball basically incinerates and evaporates everything in its way. But the fireball is the smallest part from what I've understood from looking at them of most nuclear weapons. That's, you know, pretty much the ground zero effect, but being irradiated, you know, and getting the horrible burns or being, you know, having your bones smashed or your house crushed by um, the force of the nuclear weapons, that's quite a bit of a longer range. There's a very good site called Nuke Map you can use, it's quite famous. Um, the Nuke Map lets you basically pick a place on the map, decide if you want to air burst or ground burst a nuclear weapon, pick from a load of presets or type in your own amount of tons or kilotons or megatons, whatever, and watch what happens. And, um, you know, you can use that if you knew, know where you live and you know where your closest sort of air force bases are or military bases. Um, Drop some bombs on that and see if you're going to be alright or not. You're probably not going to be alright, as I found out, even though I'm not. I'm only. I'm about 40 miles from the closest RAF base, and if that was hit by a megaton or more, I'm toast. So it gives you a good idea of, um, you know, how scary these nuclear weapons are. And as I said, not just one being dropped. If there's um, an exchange, there's going to be a lot flying about. So okay, let's talk about the fallout now. The most famous bit. Fallout is primarily alpha radiation now. If you're lucky, everything's an airburst. Airburst maximises uh, damage, but it causes less radioactivity. Ground burst is the really dangerous one. What happens is, although the ground burst does less damage to things around it, because, you know, it's got more obstacles blocking the force of the bomb, um, a ground burst is where, when the nuclear bomb detonates hitting the ground, what ends up happening is that all the dust and dirt and debris is sucked into it and blown up and outwards, being, becoming irradiated. So this is your fallout, it's basically all the dust and everything from the nuclear weapons that then settles being horribly, horribly radio radioactive. Primarily alpha radiation. Now, what makes this fallout so obviously dangerous is most people don't have the preventative measures to protect themselves from it. Now, there's a good bit of good news of uh, fallout and alpha radiation. If you've got a gas mask with a working filter on it, or even just a particle filter that works, um, you're going to protect yourself from the vast majority of it just through that alone. Not just through the mask, obviously, but protecting your respiratory system and your eyes is going to give you much bigger survival chances because alpha radiation primarily gets into the body through inhalation. However, you know, there's still other risks, obviously. If you were in the blast range and you were partially cooked by the bomb, um, but still alive, you will probably have got, you probably got a fatal dose of radiation. There are some people from Hiroshima, the victims, that did, um, you know, survive and live to quite long ages, even with the horrible burns all over their body from basically the gamma radiation, whatever else cooking them, but, um, and the beta burns, but, you know, I, I think they'd be in the minority, really, especially because you're not going to get very good medical treatment after the world ends with this nuclear exchange. So, that's obviously your fallout risk. Now, the deeper you are, the better you are protected against fallout. So if you had a big building, with a basement, especially if it had an air filtration system, you're going to be relatively safe from the fallout. Now, it's going to take several months for the amount of fallout to reduce to be at a safe level. Um, you know, and in that time, how likely are you to survive? Because, of course, another problem with nuclear war is that the other people left alive probably don't have drinkable food or edible, uh, sorry, drinkable water or edible food. Um, so they're probably going to come and kill you to get some. So, you know, you then have humans trying to kill you as well as, um, the threat of radiation and, you know, destruction of pretty much everything. Oh, but it gets worse. Because one of the scientifically considered factors in a nuclear exchange is something called nuclear winter. And the idea is that if so many nuclear bombs were set up or throwing crap into the atmosphere, it would have a similar effect to an asteroid hitting the Earth, where sunlight fails to kind of penetrate this layer, it gets very, very cold, it's very hard to grow crops, even regardless of the radiation. 
if you had a nuclear winter without any of the destruction of the bombs or um, anything like that, you know, it would still be very, very bad for everybody. But, you know, you're throwing this on top, it's the icing on the shit cake, really, isn't it? If you have all this nuclear stuff going off, and then you've got the nuclear winter on top of that. And, as said, the nuclear winter is going to make things very, very cold. You haven't got very good shelter, because all of that's been blown up and destroyed. And everything's horribly irradiated. The food is running out, and people are trying to kill you for all your food. So, overall, this is probably why nuclear war is considered to be very, very scary. Because there's a good chance that... If a full-on nuclear exchange happened, mutually assured destruction between the superpowers, there nobody would survive it. You know, there's, there's obviously lots of theories that maybe one to ten percent of the population might survive it. Um, but there's also, you know, lots of factors where just due to all of the things like nuclear winter, the massive amounts of radioactivity, um, you know, how cold it's going to get, and everything like that, that you know, maybe nobody would survive it. We'd basically wipe out all life on the earth. Maybe some isopods would survive, which can endure all these horrible conditions, but overall, the Earth would be a very, very different place. So, there you go. Hopefully, I have done a good enough job in this video explaining why nuclear weapons are just so scary.